Champions of Chaos is a DLC with four new lords, each with a different flavor, centering around the four different Chaos Gods. That comes alongside an update to the Warriors of Chaos faction. One of our initial design pillars for the, the Champions of Chaos was focusing on characters and, and their development and their promotion. And part of that was developing your Chaos Warrior units over time and also kind of fit really neatly into the marking system. Uh, we wanted to be able to promote your units and get kind of get more invested in your characters and your new units. When you have a unit of Chosen now, it's not just some random unit who you've pulled out of a, a building you know, on turn 40. They're, they are the Marauders who you've had with you since the start of the campaign. It also was as a consequence of the Warriors of Chaos not being a standard Empire Builder uh, faction. Uh, they instead want to go and raise and destroy the world and to kind of support that we allow you to upgrade your units as you're going, rather than having to go back to your settled settlement. The origins of the Warriors of Chaos kind of upgrade tree, actually um, some of the credit to that has to come to our colleagues over in Sophia on Troy, who did something very similar for Pentathalea in the Amazons DLC. And we saw that and we're like, okay, wow, this is, this is absolutely perfect for the Warriors of Chaos. And it really leans into that, that idea of the, you know, the tabletop idea of Warriors of Chaos, which is that these are, these are your, your dudes, right? It's the phrase that people always use. Like these, these are, this is your army that you've built and they have some meaning to you. So the Warriors of Chaos are a very kind of heavy frontline faction. You've got all these big dudes kind of like in full plate armor. Um, which makes them kind of like strong in, uh, in straight up fights. They've also got kind of like some tools that are a bit faster, like your Chaos Warhounds, your Marauder Horsemen, that maybe don't have as, as much armor, but they kind of help that flanking potential. The Warriors of Chaos don't want to settle everything. They don't want to develop the world. They just basically want to destroy everything. They want to destroy civilization. That doesn't lead itself well to kind of the, the existing empire building and colonizing everywhere. So instead, they want to go and destroy anything. But as we've seen in the previous iteration, once you destroy anything, a lot of other factions like to come back and colonize, kind of taking away all that progress. Part of the vassalization system is there so that your vassals can come in and take all those settlements there. And we took some inspiration actually from something that we saw in Warhammer 2 where a lot of Warriors of Chaos players, what they would do is they would ally with Thrott, Clan Mulder, and he would basically just like colonize all the settlements they raised behind them. So you kind of had this sort of uh, backfilling from your, your, your vassals, your allies in that sense. So we thought, okay, let's lean into that. So you've got that progression, they keep that progression there for you, and it allows you to then focus on destroying the world. Dark Fortresses are the main settlements for the Warriors of Chaos. They are the main hubs where they are seats of power that allows them to build up the, a base of recruitable units that they can then recruit new armies from uh, and so providing in the income and support to support those armies. So Dark Fortresses uh, are based around uh, major Chaos seats of power. So that's why they are limited to the Chaos Waste and Norska and certain law friendly settlements. A few you will notice are in the Empire uh, and there are a few in Cathay as well. Also something that's really useful within the Warriors of Chaos roster is the fact that the, all of their casters come equipped with a ton of armor. So they've got this kind of like really strong casting base from which to control the battlefield with their spells. One of the big things we did on this DLC, and it's a rework we've wanted to do for a very long time, is that obviously magic's very important in our game, a lot of spell casters. When the caster is starting to wind up to play the spell, a magic glow appears around them. For years now, we've only ever had one very generic chimey magic sound for it. On this DLC we finally put the work in and have now given all 27 lores their own bespoke sound. So when you're casting lore of fire, it sounds like fire is generated. When you're casting lore of death, you got spooky ghost whispers. It's a very subtle thing, you can only hear it to get closer to the character as they're casting, but it makes me very happy that that detail is there and I think it adds so much to the spell. And obviously, as I'm sure the fans have seen already, we've reworked entirely lore of death and lore of metal from the ground up with new VFX and new sound design. And even the other lores that have not had a rework, because we've done this casting, it makes them sound better because it ends on a big impact that's bespoke to that lore and it just goes perfectly into the next spell. It's the lore of Big Wah. We haven't touched that in years, but now it's got this big Wah orc sounding magic blast it plays that leads into all its spells and it just makes them all sound a little bit better. In the Warhammer lore, Zambaijin is this ancient city that lives somewhere on the kind of borderlands between the, the material realms and, and the realms of chaos. It has basically become over time this arena where the champions of the four gods come together and have a big kind of match to basically decide who's the top dog in that particular moment in time. And in our campaign, what has happened is that over the many kind of thousands of years that this has been happening, all of the souls of these defeated warriors who have died in these contests have kind of been absorbed into the altar of battle. And now after the events of Warhammer 3 base game, where Ursin was, was you know, dying, his 
Roars have kind of started to crack this open. So you've got these four champions of the, of the Dark Gods all coming together to try and be the people who are there when it explodes. So in gameplay terms, the way that you kind of deal with this is that because it kind of lives in this weird liminal space between the Materium and the realms of chaos, you can't just walk up to it, right? You have to basically do what chaos does best and murder a bunch of people and use their souls to kind of punch these holes through reality. And once you've kind of done, built enough of these kind of portals, that kind of allows you to triangulate in on the location of Zambai Jin, and you'll be able to travel there and, and fight the final battle. Yeah, when, when we start in mating, we uh, talk with design, they give us how the character, what the role of the character on the battlefield must be, and that then we, we do talk with character artists to, to see if there is anything that could affect the, the, the animation, and we sometimes we have a bit of margin to tweak slightly. The, the model to make things more easy for us when we start animating. Sometimes we have idea and we, we try to we try to talk with uh, VFX as much as possible to try to work together and create something something better, uh, a better end result, I would say. So the Warriors of Chaos have access to marked mortals from the complete kind of spectrum of chaos. So Korn, Zeech, Slanesh and Nurgle whereas the monogods kind of have access only to the mortals associated with their gods. Going back to the Warriors of Chaos, they have a limited access to demons, whereas the monogods do have more of this kind of access to demons within their kind of god pool. When it comes to the demons of Chaos, they're more kind of demon focused, opting to kind of pick demons from all four of the different gods. So thematically, these characters can fight for either the Warriors of Chaos or the monogod factions. So we wanted to represent this by uh, basically allowing them to fight for both in custom battle. Like, so this is done basically where this makes sense. So Sigvald, for example, can fight for the Warriors of Chaos, or he can opt to fight for Sinesh. And uh, we wanted to kind of introduce this, not only to add options to uh, the Monogod rosters, but also to provide those thematic things the community was asking for. So we wanted to meet those expectations by putting characters like Sigvald on Slanesh and really kind of opening up those options to, to field more thematic armies. If you're playing with these characters on Warriors of Chaos though, they do fall under a cap uh, when you're playing a multiplayer game. So marked mortal units are capped at four when you're playing as Warriors of Chaos. So you can only take four, for example, Chosen of Corn. But characters like Sigvald, Valkyr, Festus, they all fall under this cap as well. So they count towards your marked mortal cap. So I think we found back in um, Warhammer 2 that players really liked it when we sort of did something a bit different with the DLC narratives. I think after they kind of played that same campaign a few times, they were like, okay, let, let's have a different take on that map. And it also allows us to highlight the competition between those four in a much more kind of focused way. They're not competing, you know, with Kislev and, and the Ogres or whatever, they're competing against each other. And that allows us to kind of really bring in the narrative and focus on the four characters and their specific rivalries. So even if, you know, you're very ready to go and, you know, play Immortal Empires, you've still got the opportunity to go and do something different on Rums of Chaos as well.